All right, uh, so a very good morning, good afternoon, good evening in these very trying and unprecedented times. And again, depending on whatever part of the world we're logging in from today. Uh, welcome to the next lecture in the Mysteries of the Universe Institute lecture series organized by the Indian Institute of Technology Roorkee in India. We are so delighted to welcome Professor Robert Digraf as our distinguished speaker for today. Uh, Professor Robertus Hendrickus, or Robert Digraf, as we all know, is the director and the Leon Levy Professor at the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton and a distinguished professor at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he is a mathematical physicist who has made, as we all know, significant contributions to string theory and the advancement of science education. His research focuses on the interface between mathematics and particle physics and includes in particular uh, so those of us who work in string theory obviously don't need all of this, but uh, we have many students in the audience. So uh, for that sake, for their sake, uh, uh, he has made incredible contributions in the, in the areas like matrix models, topological string theory, supersymmetric quantum field theory, uh, topological field theory. Um, I think uh, those of us who work in string theory are obviously aware of the, the famous... Uh, Digraph VAPA invariants uh, on three manifolds, et cetera. He has a, a very long list of awards and honors, some of which include, uh, in 2003, he was awarded the Spinoza Prize. And I'm given to understand there was a very interesting uh, trivia associated with that, which is the following, that he became the first recipient of the award whose supervisor, uh, uh, which, uh, who was Professor Gerardo Toft, also received uh, the prize way back in 95. And I'm also given to understand that Professor Digraph used a part of this grant to set up a website uh, for children to promote science. Uh, Professor Digraph was elected a member of the Royal uh, Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2003. Uh, 2008 through 12, he was the president, uh, president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, he was elected as one of the two co-chairs of the Inter-Academy Council for the period 2009 through 13. He was also elected to the Royal Holland Society of Sciences and Humanities. In 12, 2012, he was elected an honorary member of both the Royal Netherlands Chemical Society and the Netherlands Physical Society. In 2012, he was appointed a Knight of the Order of the Netherlands Lion. The same year, he became a Fellow of the American Mathematical Society. He was elected an honorary Fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh in 2013. And in the same year, uh, he was elected to the American Philosophical Society. In 2019, he was awarded the inaugural Iris Medal for Excellent Science Communication uh, presented uh, at The Hog by Ingrid von Engelsholmen, who is the Minister of Education, Culture and Science in the presence of His Majesty King Willem Alexander. So with that, I humbly request Professor Digraph to please deliver his lecture. Professor Digraph. Well, thank you so much, Alok, for this uh, much too long intro uh, introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be with you. I also realize now these are very difficult and trying times, uh, particularly in India, but I would say across the world. And I was uh, talking, uh, we were talking about uh, in the, before this lecture, that uh, you know, we have been here before as, as scientists. I love this image. Uh, this is actually from the New York Times magazine in 1941, when the world was, of course, gripped in a, in, in, in a, a world war, and it says this seeking eternal truth in a world of chaos. And I love the, the big shadow that Einstein is projecting over the blackboard, but also just realize that, you know, even in very difficult and trying times, you now one, one of the things that motivate us, particularly as scientists, is that we are thinking about these deep questions, trying to understand the world around us. And uh, you know, I think uh, you know, having these, this, this passion and this, this quest helps us also to, uh, to deal with uh, everyday life that's sometimes very, very difficult. And so I think just as in 1941, Einstein kept thinking about space and time, I think we should uh, keep doing this too. Now, um, if we think about space, of course, space for a long time has been seen as a, like a decor, like a, a background in which the physical phenomena take place. Uh, the same way time uh, was seen as a, a big clock ticking 
and coordinating and organizing all physical phenomena, as Isaac Newton famously said, something that flows on without regards to anything external. And of course, Einstein's great contribution is to change our concepts of space and time. Uh, for one thing, he said that the two should belong together. The famous saying that time should be thought of as the fourth dimension. And particularly for the students, now, how, how do we think about this? Well, here's a, here's a two plus one dimensional example. Here you see a, a plane, you see two particles moving in the plane. And if you look at this movie, you can think of the individual uh, images out of which this uh, movie is made out. And if you would stack them vertically, you, uh, uh, you see that they are organized chronologically and they're organized in time. And so essentially by gluing all these slices of space together, we get a three-dimensional, in this case, uh, piece of space-time. And the individual particles now become what we call these world lines, these spaghetti strands flowing upwards in time. Now, a remarkable thing is that uh, this space-time uh, can be cut in various ways. You can cut it, uh, as you originally thought was, uh, as, a, as a number of space-like slices. So these are, in this case, the, the red and the green events are happening at the same time. But Einstein also showed us that it can be, be cut in different ways. And so the whole concept of space and time become kind of intermingled and confusing. The next step he did is actually allowing gravity to be part of that picture. And there's a famous anecdote that he was watching uh, repairmen on the roof of a building across his a university building and wondered what would happen if these workers would fall down. And then he had what he called himself the happiest thought in his life. Namely, if you would fall down, you would actually not experience gravity. And so his his change of perspective was that you know we should one should think of falling as the natural flow, the natural movement. But uh, and this is of course uh, you know falling also explains gravity. That is to say, if you if you throw a ball fast enough, it will go into orbit under the Earth. But if, if falling is the natural flow, why do we see these, for instance, circular orbits of like an object like the moon uh, orbiting the Earth? And of course, the next step in his thinking was that you can explain that by assuming that space time is not rigid, uh, but is curved. And that uh, it's not only a curved space-time, but it's a space-time that can react dynamically. It can react on energy and mass to, uh, to adapt and change its curvature. Now, Einstein was a wonderful person in writing down like iconic equations. Of course, we all know e equals mc squared. But the equation that describes the theory of gravity, general relativity, should be actually even be more famous. It's a little bit more convoluted. A g mu nu equals 8 pi g over c to the fourth t mu nu. That's actually not something you... Uh, but the most important thing of an equation, of Einstein's equation in particular, is the equal sign in between. That connects the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the equation. Just like e equals, equals mc squared tells us that energy on the left and mass on the right uh, have a, a relation. Can be One can be... Uh, uh, transformed into the other and back. Here the equation essentially writes space equals mass. The left-hand side of this equation describes the curvature of space and time. The right-hand side describes the distribution of mass and energy. And so we can read this equation from the left to the right and from the right to the left. If we read it uh, in one direction, it can, you can basically say that mass, the right-hand side, tell space-time how to curve. In fact, if you put a massive object in space-time, uh, this kind of background, this stage on which physical phenomena act, is interactive and it starts to change. It will curve under the influence of the distribution of mass. Reading the equation the, the other direction, it's space-time telling mass how to move. And uh, by essentially telling that uh, objects try to go as straight as possible in that curved uh, space-time. Technical terms is follow a geodesic. So for instance, the orbit of the moon around the Earth could be seen as the natural movement in a curved space-time, which actually then explains this circular orbit. 
Well, when you have that image of a curved space-time, then Einstein immediately realized that everything, including light, will be curved by uh, the under the influence of gravity. And this allowed him to propose the famous experiment looking at the deflection of starlight by the sun and realizing that this could be done, uh, only could be done during an eclipse. Now, his theory was formulated in 1915, but he had to wait four years after the First World War for this experiment to be done. And it's the famous uh, Eddington um, expedition that measured uh, this deflection of the starlight. And here is the image. And I like that image in particular because it's here at the Institute for Advanced Study in our archives. And it was actually the image that was in Einstein's possession. And it's this image that made him famous. So on November 7th, 1919, uh, at the Royal Society of London, uh, Eddington announced this uh, revolution in science. Here you see it's, uh, it says uh, Newtonian ideas overthrown. It was not on the front page of the Times. It was uh, somewhere inside uh, on the, in the uh, small news items. But of course, it was soon picked up by all the news items, particularly you know, uh, in, in the United States. And um, within a month, Albert Einstein was world famous. I like this image in the middle. It's from uh, a Berlin Illustrated Zeitung. And it says, a new uh, giant of world history. So within a few weeks, the world realized what had happened. And you know, Einstein became really famous. And I'd like want to show you a little clip of him arriving in the United States. Scientists of Germany in the greatest city of the world. I'm delighted. I'm delighted. What do you think of prohibition, uh, Professor? Ich trinke nicht, also ist mir das ganz gleich. Professor, a Freud is CC here in America, bitte zu sein. Wenn ich sie sehe, sicher. I love that image because it also uh, shows uh, his great sense of humor. Of course, with his theory of gravity, Einstein could do something that nobody had done before, is namely calculate the history of the universe. And he made this uh, wonderful uh, discovery that the universe was expanding and immediately realized that that also meant that the universe should have began in, uh, in, in a singularity, in a big bang. And that was such a striking thought so much against the current uh, way of thinking that he did something quite dramatic. He changed his equation. He put an extra term in the equation, essentially a new force field that would stop the universe from expanding. When a few years later, the expanding universe was discovered by astronomers, Einstein is uh, uh, said to have uh, mentioned that this was the biggest blunder of his life. So the real discovery of the expanding universe was actually done by Georges Lemaitre, uh, a Belgian priest and cosmologist uh, who uh, coined also the word primeval atom or cosmic act for the Big Bang. Um, that actually didn't work. And uh, a few years later, Edward Hubble, the American astronomer, actually made the astronomical measurements that confirmed this particular image. And so we have this wonderful idea of the universe as an inflating balloon. Now, when Einstein uh, theory led to all these remarkable ideas, but when he passed away in 1955, uh, I read in one of his obituaries that his physics was seen as a great work of art, of deep philosophical ideas. And of course, that's the worst to hear if you are a physicist because you don't want to be a philosopher, you actually want to explain how the universe works. And unfortunately, many of the predictions that Einstein made were essentially a hundred years predictions. You know, The world had to uh, take the better part of a century to build the technology to actually confirm the deepest ideas. And remarkably, some of the deepest ideas of Einstein, uh, he didn't himself believe because sometimes the theory that you discover is smarter than the person who discovers it. 
So I would say the modern period of uh, relativity theory started in 1965 with the discovery by these two radio engineers in Bell Labs here in New Jersey, who uh, you know, found this kind of hissing sound in their microwave telescope. And they thought that this was uh, just noise. But of course, what they did dis discover was uh, the earliest light emitted by the universe. There's this concept of first light that after roughly 400,000 years, uh, the universe, which originally was extremely dense, so dense that matter locked up light, uh, the photons of light, that after 400,000 years, the universe was kind of uh, uh, diluted enough so that the light could escape. And it's that light that we can measure. It's now uh, in the form of microwave radiation. And so we can basically look back to see a baby picture of the universe. So this is me when I was one year old. Um, and this is the universe when it was uh, very young, uh, only 380,000 years old. Uh, so we are looking back almost 13.8 billion years. And this, this uh, kind of pontalistic painting, I think is one of the most iconic images of our time. It shows that indeed the universe started in a Big Bang and you can think of this as, you know, as if you would look as far as possible out in the universe, uh, you have an ultimate shell. If you look back like the beginning of time, you would be, uh, the universe would be surrounded by this shell of cosmic microwave background radiation. And it's very similar to these kind of medieval uh, images that uh, you know, we find in European manuscripts with the earth in the middle and the various kind of celestial spheres surrounding it. Now, the remarkable thing is that you know, with all our uh, scientific insight, we can essentially summarize this almost 14 billion years of cosmic evolution in this small animation. So here in 20 seconds, you see how the small initial fluctuations um, draw matter together. They make clumps of matter, the first stars, the first galaxies, very violent explosions. And then slowly more mature, larger galaxies are being formed, including our Milky Way, the star and planet Earth. And so we have this full space-time picture of cosmologic, cosmological evolution. Now, it's wonderful that we uh, understand so much, but I think actually trying to understand the cosmos is very much like these old explorers that use these kind of maps where some part of the world was known, that's the known universe. But in the unknown part of the world, these old cartographers would often write Hicksum Draconis, which Latin for here live dragon, dragons. And so these were this kind of sea monsters that you know, were, of course, figments of the imagination. But they stood for the things that we do not understand. So I want to spend the rest of my lecture by kind of talking about these sea monsters. We call them dark matter, dark energy. Uh, black holes and the Big Bang itself. These are just beautiful names for things that we don't fully understand. Now to start with dark matter, if you look at our galaxies, we discovered through careful measurements that they surrounded by huge clouds of matter. We call it dark matter, but a better word would be transparent matter. It's a matter where light just can pass through. And in fact, there's so much that if you would look at the universe, at the stars, and galaxies, and would be able to see this dark matter, you would see that there actually is much more dark matter, five times more than the visible matter out of which uh, our stars and planets and nebula are made. In fact, I often think about the stars as the Christmas lights in a Christmas tree, and if the dark matter would be more like the branches and, uh, and leaves of that, of that tree, which are unfortunately invisible. Now, there are beautiful animations like this, theoretical animation, what the universe would look like if we would be able to see dark matter. We'd see these big strands of, uh, of that dark matter that basically is holding the universe together. And indeed, the galaxies are like Christmas lights pinned on these, uh, this web, this web of dark matter. Well, a second sea monster discovery is the fact that the universe not only expands, but it expands faster and faster. It's accelerating. And uh, so you can think of empty space as like a sponge that's been kind of squeezed together. And uh, whenever it creates more 
empty space, it creates even further forces expanding universe. So this is exactly Einstein's cosmological constant. However, with the wrong sign, Einstein wanted a cosmological constant that prevented the universe from accelerating, that de-accelerated. In fact, the physical phenomena is exactly the opposite one. So if you would kind of, uh, I like this image of the universe, as a, if the, in, the content of the universe as a cocktail, and you find a remarkable thing that only 5% of what we see out there, we understand, you can learn in your physics books, it's all the particles and forces and radiation that we know on planet Earth, and 95%, the dark matter and dark energy is unknown. Well, the third uh, sea monster is black holes. You know, and black holes are also, you know, it's remarkable that they've been around for a long time. Einstein very strongly felt um, they didn't, wouldn't have a role in his theory, but of course they do. And you can explain the concept of a black hole to, you know, any, any school uh, child, school student. Because we all know that, you know, to escape the gravitational force of our planet, you, know, so you can ask, you know, how fast do you have to throw a ball in order to uh, land uh, on the moon? You now you have to overcome the escape velocity of planet Earth with 11 kil kilometers per second. So it's something like 32 times the speed of sound, which is, you know, pretty, pretty significant. That's why we need big rockets. And in fact, if you would be able to throw something uh, standing on the surface of the sun, then this escape velocity would be much, much higher. Uh, and people already in the 18th century realized, well, now if the escape velocity of a star would be larger than the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, then the light itself will be pulled back onto the star and you would have like a black star. Um, the British uh, scientist John Mitchell and the famous French uh, astronomer Pierre Simon Laplace both uh, suggested this possibility. And it's remarkable that just a few months after Einstein wrote down his famous equations, the German um, astronomer Karl Schwarzschild was actually fighting this point uh, on the Eastern Front of uh, World War I, uh, discovered the famous Schwarzschild solution, an equation that is uh, an exact solution to Einstein theory that indeed includes uh, the description of a black hole. And very tragically, Schwarzschild died soon after his discovery. Well, what is a black hole? Black hole is essentially a, a, a point from the curvature of space-time when the, the throat of this, 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 this curved um, part actually becomes infinitely deep. It's an infinite deep well. Uh, in a little bit more physical terms, when the star collapses to form a black hole, it, all the matter shrinks into a singularity. But that singularity is, is surrounded by the so-called event horizon. And one way to think about it is that it separates a no-go area, namely that part where the gravitational field is so strong that the escape velocity is larger than the speed of light, with a safe area. And if, as long as you stay outside the horizon, light and any uh, can escape. In principle, uh, you can communicate within that safe area. The calculation of the radius of that event horizon, the Schwarzschild radius, is only twice what the naive calculation in Newton's theory would be. So it's essentially very similar. And just to get a sense for this, if planet Earth would be a black hole, it would be the size of a marble. Of course, it would still weigh as much as the full Earth. If the sun would be a black hole, if a, a stellar object becomes a black hole, then it would typically be the size of a big city. Our sun would have a radius of three kilometers, so incredibly small on astrophysical scales. But there are also black holes in the centers of galaxies, including our Milky Way. And these so-called supermassive black holes are millions to billions uh, the mass of a stellar black hole. And the radius, as we saw, of a black hole scales linearly with this mass. So for instance, there is a black hole in the center of a Milky Way. And just to see it, this is our sun and this is planet Earth. If we shrink the sun to this size, then you know this uh, Sagittarius A star, this uh, supermassive black hole in the center of the Milky Way would easily capture the orbit of Mercury. So it would be gigantic on the scale of our solar system. 
Now, astronomers have uh, looked at the galactic center for a long time, and if they zoom in, you see there are many, many stars there. It's very crowded. It's very violent. You see lots of uh, you know, radio sources. And by studying the center, you can see here the very, very center, uh, you see they saw something remarkable. They saw the stars are moving. Uh, this, of course, is a speed up movie, but they move on the scale of years. Uh, while like our sun takes 220 million years to make one orbit around uh, the Milky Way, these stars move, move much faster and they've been tracked very carefully. And if you track them very carefully, you see you get something like a, a macroscopic version of our solar system where our sun is replaced by the black hole and the planets are replaced by stars that orbit the black holes. Well, the careful measurements of this system led to uh, one half of the Nobel Prize in Physics last year to uh, Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Guess, who uh, made these very careful observations. Now, we cannot only see these black holes indirectly, we can also hear them. And there's another astonishing prediction of Albert Einstein's theory is that you can have gravitational waves actually that go with the speed of light. If you move your arm, you're essentially making a small disturbance of space-time, and that disturbance propagates out. Now, it's very difficult to measure, and Einstein himself said that it's a wonderful prediction, but we'll never ever be able to measure this, because he calculated that this would be an effect of essentially 10 to the minus 45. But he was, again, um, you know, uh, too modest both in terms of the phenomena that happen in the universe and our ingenuity to measure these very small effects. Because there are really dramatic events, and the most dramatic event to create a uh, gravitational waves, if you have two very dense objects, like two neutron stars or two black holes orbiting each other, these waves are very, very powerful and can be picked up on planet Earth. And the measurements that have been done is this, this wonderful laboratory. It's the LIGO Observatory, uh, essentially three kilometer long arms, where if a wave passes, they shrink a little bit, and uh, they are able to, to measure essentially uh, to an accuracy of 10 to the minus 21. It's like measuring the distance to the nearest star up to the width of a hair. People have told me if a, if a little uh, cloud passes, along the LIGO observatory, then actually uh, you can, they can measure the gravitational pull of the cloud. So if you're lying on your back and you're looking at the clouds and you feel uplifted, this is actually a physical phenomenon. So what they did in uh, actually on the September 14th, 2015, is uh, hear this particular sound. So it's repeated here. It's a very subtle chirp, uh, but it's actually quite something significant. It was coming from 1.5 billion light years away. So it happened 1.5 billion light years ago. And what happened actually was this thing you just saw, two black holes orbiting each other and colliding and forming one black hole. The moment of that explosion, the power of it was that more energy was released in that millisecond than the whole physical universe, the electromagnetic radiation of the whole physical universe together. So it's one of the most powerful explosions. And now, of course, it opened up gravitational waves as a very interesting window on the universe. Um, it's not that often that we uh, discover uh, a new force or a new kind of radiation uh, basically, all of astronomy has happened with electromagnetic radiation. Now we have gravitational waves too. And the wonderful thing is we are moving towards this kind of worldwide laboratory. And I'm so uh, happy that also in India now there is a branch of LIGO. And so we really are using the planet as an observation, uh, an observation station. Now, in fact, these days you can have an app on your phone that actually alerts you when one of these collisions is made. I have it, it's wonderful. Now, certainly it buzzes. And you know that somewhere in the universe, two black holes or a black hole and a neutron star or two neutron stars have collapsed. And uh, you, get a, you get a text message from the universe. Isn't that wonderful? 
Now, we can only hear, we can also see these black holes. And in fact, uh, the largest black hole that we know of is uh, a black hole in a giant elliptic galaxy, M87. It's 55 million light years away. That black hole is 6.5 billion solar masses. And just to think of the scale of this galaxy, here's the Milky Way at the same scale. So uh, our Milky Way, our majestic Milky Way, is dwarfed by this elliptic galaxy. In fact, if you think of the black hole that's out there in M87, now here's our full solar system, including the Kuiper belt of asteroids and you know, our Voyager and Pioneer probes that are already left the, 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 the inner solar system. All of that would be swallowed by this black hole. So easily it could contain the full solar system. In order to see this is a gigantic black hole, but it's far away. It's equivalent to looking at a donut on the moon or uh, actually looking at your thumb and seeing the individual atoms. And you can calculate in order to see this object from that far away, you need a telescope that's essentially the size of the planet. And the remarkable thing is here, of course, you know, everybody would stop. Um, but, um, and that's why people thought we we're never able to see black holes. But actually, by connecting radio telescopes around the world, astronomers were able to create a virtual telescope of the size of the planet. And uh, you know, they had, this was a wonderful discovery. And here you see a beautiful animation of this so-called event horizon telescope. We, here we're zooming in on um, this uh, gigantic, there it is, the galaxy. We zoom in, we see this huge radio beam coming out and then this iconic image of this glowing ring of matter that's you know, just about uh, not falling into the black hole. It's light that's able to escape and reach planet Earth. And of course, this was an iconic image. It was on all the front pages uh, above the fold around the world. And it's, it's rare that we have these moments that you know, there's positive news on every newspaper and that we as a world are connecting. A few years earlier, I was asked to actually paint for the Black Hole Center at Harvard, a mural of black holes. Uh, don't criticize the art, but I painted the black hole and I said, well, if the actual measurement comes out differently, I come and repaint it. And this was my artist impression. And I must say, it looked pretty good. And uh, I think they're still happy with their mural. So black holes are there. But why did I call them sea monsters? What are the issues surrounding them? So here you see the space-time picture of a black hole. Uh, the stars implodes. And you see this kind of uh, cylinder now, because we also have time. Uh, this, this area, this no-go area of the horizon around it. Now, in these space-time pictures, by definition, time is flowing upwards. But inside the black hole, something quite remarkably happens. Because actually, time reverses its direction. Instead of flowing vertically upwards, it's flowing inwards. So it's almost like, you know, like the radial distance. So the moment you're inside the black hole, there's only a finite amount of time. So you're in this black hole, and there's, say, only eight seconds of time. And so it's, it's like you're watching a, a video of a movie, and you know there's still eight seconds to, to go. You know the movie had to come to an end. So the remarkable thing about black holes, striking thing, is that actually it's the end of time. And so if we think of the universe and the history of the universe, you can say it was born in a big bang, and which is the beginning of time. And time ends, not at once, but you know, in each individual black holes. And you know, we have discovered the black hole in every center of every galaxy. And there are, you know, there are uh, roughly 10 to 11 galaxies in our, our vis physical visible universe. And there are perhaps thousands, if not millions of black holes in each galaxy. So there are all these moments where time is ending. So both the Big Bang and black holes confront us with this question, how can time begin and how can it end? And the famous physicist John Wheeler said, you know, the existence of space-time singularities Big Bang or black hole, represents an end to the principle of sufficient causation, and so to the predictable gained by science. How could physics 
lead to a violation of itself? How could physics lead to no physics? And the fact that in the Big Bang, there is something happening without something happening before. And in a black hole, there's something happening without something after. That was actually the reason why Einstein hated these two elements so much, because they undercut the most important element of science, which I like to say science is the answer to the question, what happens next? We always want to predict the future and we want to postdict the past. That's what science is all about. So how can time begin and end? So I would say that black holes and the Big Bang confront us with essentially what is the fabric of space-time. In order to see an ordinary fabric, where it's made of, you go to the very edges, and there you see the, see the strands out of which space and time are produced. So black holes and the Big Bang offers us a lens on what the fabric of space-time is. And in order to ask these questions, we have to go to the world of quantum mechanics, to something which is now very, very different than the theory of relativity. It's about probabilities. It's about uncertainties. Um, and always love this uh, wonderful anecdote that actually uh, Richard Feynman describes in his Nobel Prize lecture in 1965. He says that at some point, he was called by his, his supervisor, Professor John Wheeler, who said, Feynman, I know why all electrons have the same charge and the same mass. Why? Well, because they are all the same electron. And this is the image that John Wheeler has. Here's space time. Here's a particle. It's one particle. But suppose that this particle could not only go upward in time, but also downward in time and up again. It would be able to weave this big knot. And if we now look at this as a sequence of moments, in space and time, we slice space time in temporal slices. We see there's one particle in the initial slice, but in the intermediate slices, there are many particles. In fact, there are particles and antiparticles, the red and the blue ones, electrons and positrons, popping up and disappearing again. And, um, and so this image actually is something that was absolutely crucial to Feynman's de uh, development of Feynman diagrams. And we actually think this is happening. If you look at a particle, uh, there are all these kind of what we call virtual particles going around. In fact, there is an ultimate process. Now, what can happen that out of empty space time, a particle and antiparticle can be created and they can disappear again. And you can think of this as something that goes up and down in time in an internal loop. This is not science fiction. This is happening all around this. The quantum vacuum, and I hope you appreciate my PowerPoint uh, animation here, is this bubbling uh, pot of virtual particles that continuously come and the, uh, in existence and disappear again. And they uh, often, it's being said, this is wonderful wisecrack of Murray Gell-Mann, that in quantum theory, everything that is allowed is obligatory. So all possible processes happen in the world of quantum mechanics. Of course, some with more probability than the others. But the particularly empty space is not empty space. Empty space is filled with quantum phenomena. And in fact, that has tremendous consequences. And let me mention two of them. And both of them relate to black holes and the Big Bang. The first is the observation of Stephen Hawking, that if we look at uh, black holes, then we shouldn't think of them as sitting in empty space, because they're sitting in this quantum vacuum. So around the black hole, continuously, particles are created and disappear again. And then he realized what happens if these particles are created close to the black hole horizon. You could have a situation depicted here that you have a particle and antiparticle. They create just on the edge of the horizon. The green particle can escape. It can go out. But the red particle, the antiparticle, is trapped behind the horizon. Notice these are virtual particles, so they can have negative energy. So if the green particle has positive energy and can escape, the red particle has negative energy and it's falling inside the black hole. But since negative mass is falling inside, the mass of the black hole actually decreases. And so this looks like the black hole is evaporating. Particles are escaping. There is a loophole, there's a quantum mechanical loophole, and things can escape from a, from a black hole. And the way they, this process looks like, at least statistically, it's like thermal radiation. 
So Einstein of uh, Hawking famously calculated the temperature of this so-called Hawking radiation. It's one of the most beautiful equations in physics. It basically tells you that the temperature T is inverse proportional to the mass. It goes like one over M. But then there are four constants of nature. And all of them, uh, I've um, depicted them here in color, relate to different areas in physics. So here we see H bar. It's a quantum mechanical phenomena. We see C, the speed of light, has to do with special relativity. We see G, Newton's constant. So it's a gravitational effect. And we also see K, Boltzmann's constant, which means it has something to do to the laws of thermodynamics. So it's the one equation that ties together the four, I would say, main branches of physics. In fact, uh, Hawking so much liked that formula that it's engraved on his tomb, tombstone in Westminster Abbey, where he's buried together with Newton and Dirac. And uh, you see the famous uh, Hawking temperature equation there. There's a second reason why, why quantum theory is important to us. As I said, you know, there is this quantum vacuum, empty space should be thought of as this bubbling pot of virtual particles. Now there's a certain energy associated to that. In fact, you can just measure this energy in empty space, the energy of the quantum vacuum in the laboratory um, setting. And that's called the Casimir energy after the famous uh, Dutch quantum physicist, Hendrik Casimir. But there's something also happening on a cosmological scale. And so we think that the dark energy, this force that pushes the universe apart is a reflection of what happens on the microscopic scale. In fact, you know, if you think of the empty space as this sponge that is kind of expanding, it basically tells, well, if we zoom in and zoom in on the sponge, we see the little, little holes in space-time. You can calculate what is the, this granular structure of space-time, what is essentially the size of a pixel of an atom of space-time. And this is a calculation that was already done by Max Planck uh, in the year 1900, he realized that the moment you introduce the Planck's constant, and you also have Newton's constant and the speed of light, there's a natural scale, a natural length scale and a mass scale called the Planck length and the Planck mass. Well, the Planck length is incredibly small. It's 10 to the minus 35 meters. And uh, just to indicate that this is, you know, the smallest sizes that we essentially are able to measure um, uh, is, is uh, 10 to the minus 20 meters. So we are far, far below what can be measured. But there is an ultimate length scale. And one way to understand is that, you know, if you would use a microscope to look at smaller and smaller distances, we know that you need to use light of higher and higher frequencies. That is to say, a smaller wavelength because the energy scales inversely proportional to the length. So in order to see something very tiny, you need light of a very small wavelength. Like for instance, to see atoms, you need X-rays. While in order to see uh, bacteria, you can use visible light. On the other hand, if you concentrate energy in a very small length scale, we know that something can happen. At some point, a black hole can happen. So in fact, black holes scale linearly with their size. So if we put enough energy in order to see a very small object, then actually you won't see anything because that light will actually collapse on top of itself and we create a little black hole. So there is like a minimal length scale in which you can observe the smallest structures in the universe before actually small black holes will form. And if you just look where these two lines cross, they cross at the scale of the Planck length. So intuitively you can think of the Planck length as the scale in which a, a beam of light or any other measurement would collapse on top of itself and create small black holes. And so if you think of space time as this kind of sponge where there are little bubbles, think of these bubbles essentially as little black holes that eat up space time. Well, it's another reason, by the way, why the Planck length enters. If you are a particle physicist and you would like to try to scatter two quanta of gravity, two gravitons, they would scatter with a, with a force that's proportional to Newton's constant. And another way to express this is that Newton's constant is inverse proportionally to the Planck mass, so the mass scale. So you can also think that there is a, there is a dimension full coupling constant 
from a particle points uh, point of view, and that actually makes gravity a non renormalizable theory. So I suggest that we should think of space time not as something uh, solid, but something that's kind of has full of these quantum fluctuations. And just to put it, you know, if we look at the smallest and the largest scales in the universe, we've discovered that quantum mechanics tells us there's a smaller scale, uh, 10 to the minus 35 meters. It uh, doesn't make sense to ask questions at smaller distances. There's a larger scale, which is the size of the visible physical universe, the Hubble scale. And remarkably, uh, now our scale, the scale of life or biological life, so basically the size of a bacteria is just in between. And if you go one quarter to the right, you see you're roughly at the, the distance to the moon. Uh, that's the scale in which human beings have traveled. And if you go take one step uh, of one quarter step to the left, you're at 10 to the minus 20 meters which is roughly the energy and length scales, which we have probed at the subnuclear scale using our accelerators. Uh, that's where the, the Large Hadron Collider in CERN Geneva is probing our physics. So there's still 15 orders of magnitude to the left. But isn't it remarkable that we know that in order to describe the universe, we only have to understand these 60 powers of 10, these 60 order of magnitudes going from the very smallest and the very largest. The fact that there is a very smallest and there is a very lar largest distance scale are both tremendous insights of physics. And philosophers often ask, you know, what happens if you shrink to an infinitely small, or if you think of the infinitely large? And basic physics is, uh, is telling you, don't worry, there is an upper bound and a lower bound in physics. Now, why is this, uh, you know, this, this Planck scale important? Well, you know, one of the questions, of course, that, you know, why Einstein was objecting to the expanding universe is that there's this perennial question that any, we all ask, that every physics student or physics professor is being asked, what happened before the Big Bang? And again, quantum theory seems to give a wonderful explanation. There's a lot of, uh, you know, indications that the universe not only expanded slowly over billions of years, but there was a period of rapid cosmic inflation, uh, you know, a, a huge expansion where the universe essentially expanded from something the size of a tennis ball to the current size uh, in, in just a fraction of a second, um, just before essentially the hot Big Bang happened. And during that expansion, what were originally quantum fluctuations were frozen out as these density perturbations that we can measure using the cosmic microwave background. So you now one of the big questions, of course, why this pontalistic painting that we see in the sky of why these small fluctuations that seed all structure formation in the universe? And one possible, and I think very likely answer, is because the universe, when it was very, very, very tiny, was so small it had to obey the laws of quantum mechanics. And so there was a certain amount of randomness. So in this sense, you, you can ask, you know, why do we have quantum theory? But perhaps a very deep philosophical explanation that we have quantum theory to uh, give an answer to another perennial question. Why is there something instead of nothing? How did the universe got started? Why are the, where was there these differences that in the end led to the stars and galaxies and planets? And if the answer is, well, because the universe was quantum mechanical, I think that's very beautiful. It's very poetic that the smaller structures in our understanding of the universe explain the larger structures. So all of this is pointing out that quantum mechanics is really important in our understanding of space and time. And that perhaps space and time are not the final word. Uh, that we some sense should look at what are essentially are the atoms, the pixels of space and time. Now, there are some wonderful ideas coming from, I would say, the only full-fledged theory of quantum gravity that we have is string theory. Now, in string theory, we are not thinking of particles. We literally are thinking of little loops, one-dimensional objects. And there are many ways in which they uh, somehow give interesting ideas of the theory of gravity. Now, one way to think about this, you can think, if you know, we already said that if you try to scatter gravitons, you get something that's proportional to one over the Planck mass squared. 
So you can think of this, this is an intermediate particle that actually is kind of uh, modifying and uh, uh, mitigating this kind of uh, ugly quantum properties of Newtonian, of Einsteinian gravity. And so th strings could be really as quantum gravitational objects. In fact, the graviton itself is one of the oscillation of a string. So this process would look more like this, one of these kind of uh, world sheet diagrams. And in fact, it's very easy uh, using this language of strings to also include quantum effects, to have kind of loop effects by just having surfaces of more complicated topology. A second element that string theory tells us is that not only are there these closed strings that uh, represent the graviton, there are also open strings, these kind of uh, little um, you know, intervals, little pieces of string with two open ends. And these ends can be tethered to sub-manifolds, uh, membranes, brains living in space-time. Uh, and remarkably, they are described using not the language of gravity, but the language of, of gauge fields and the language that we use to describe our fundamental forces. In fact, there's a beautiful um, observation uh, made in many, many contexts that if you have a lot of these brains, so you put a lot of these objects in space time, uh, that the open strings uh, describing that cluster of brains is equivalent to uh, a curved space time. So in some sense, you can produce um, the, the curvature of space time uh, by looking at fixed objects in space time. So it's almost like explaining why this uh, gravity curve, if you put energy and mass there. And so this uh, so-called gauge gravity duality has been very, very if, uh, leading our thinking about quantum gravity. So here's a cartoon version of what happens. So in string theory, so here's a black hole, you see its horizon. Out in the space time, there are all these uh, curved, uh, the, all these uh, closed strings, they represent uh, the gravitational force. So effectively they, they lead to this curvature of space time. And then there are these kind of open strings that are living on the brain, uh, which essentially is the horizon of the black hole. And now the microscopic rules of string theory allow you to compute various processes, for instance, Here's my cartoon version of Hawking radiation. So two of these open strings moving on the membrane of the horizon can actually merge together. Two open strings can form one closed string that then can, es can escape and, you know, uh, and move out in space time. And so this actually allows us to calculate in a microscopic way the process of Hawking radiation. Uh, in fact, it's even a much more powerful image has emerged that in some sense, all of gravity can this be described by what's called a hologram. You know, a, 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 a theory that doesn't include gravity, that it's purely quantum mechanical, and that's uh, in some sense controlling space time. So I would say, you know, it's all extremely exciting and black holes are key to this. So I would say a black hole is a very similar to what an atom was 100 years ago. A hundred years ago, we knew atoms exist. They were, uh, there was experimental proof, but we didn't understand how they work because, you know, according to the classical laws of physics, they would collapse. Electrons would spiral into the singularity of the nucleus. Now we are in a similar situation. We know atoms exist. In the theory of gravity, they exist. They're very, there's the most simple objects in physics. They're just a big hole in space. But from the point of view of quantum theory, they're the most complex objects in the world. In fact, we can calculate, again, using the work of Hawking and Jacob Bekenstein, the information content of a black hole. And in fact, you would be able to put all of the digital information in the current uh, planet in a black hole that is smaller than the size of an electron. So it's, it's, it's the most efficient quantum information storage device that we know. So how can something be the most simple and the most complex object at the same time and yet exist? So this is our homework exercise. We know the universe has found a solution because black holes are out there, but how do we understand them? And one wonderful uh, way of thinking is this, this a uh, famous uh, uh, image that uh, was coined, this phrase coined by John Wheeler, 
he said it, it from bit. His idea was that there's something more fundamental than space and time, which is information. And that perhaps space and time are derived objects. They are knitted together by connecting space and time and by connecting information. And remarkable, these ideas again go back to Albert Einstein. So you know, Einstein is that moved to Princeton in 1933. And of course, many people think that at that time, his most important physical work, his research work was done. But it's not true. In 1935, there were two papers he wrote that are absolutely essential to uh, our new thinking. The first is the so-called famous EPR, or einstein podolsky rosen paradox. The fact that he, they found that information in quantum theory is non-local. In fact, uh, uh, Podolsky was so excited when they made this discovery that he ran to the New York Times and you know, this led to the headline, Einstein attacks quantum theory. And uh, Einstein was really upset and didn't want to work with Podolsky anymore. The second paper, uh, was soon thereafter, two months thereafter, now only with Rosen, which is called the particle problem general theory of relativity. And essentially it describes the geometry of an eternal black hole solution and shows that the black hole is not an infinite tube, an infinite well, but in fact, essentially what we now call a wormhole and they call the bridge connecting two universes or two parts of the universe. Now, the newest insight that these two papers of Einstein, noting bizarre elements, I would say non-local elements, both of quantum mechanics and general relativity can be connected. So the entanglement, what we now call the entanglement, what Einstein called the spooky action at a distance, that quantum mechanical information can be uh, non-locally connected, that a particle at one part of the universe can be uh, somehow, uh, it, from an information point of view, is linked uh, with another particle very far away. The fact that quantum mechanics cannot be localized is similar to the fact that space cannot be localized. In fact, that space is kind of knitted together. You know, black holes can be knitted together through these wormholes. And the modern incarnation of these both ideas um, is, you know, in, in a small variant of John Wheeler's motto that you know, it's not it from bit, but it's it from qubit. Because quantum bits of information, qubits, are not just zeros and ones. They're quantum information, and that means that they're entangled. So these informations, they weave a big web of entanglement. And the modern insight is that entanglement, that non-locality in quantum theory, might be exactly what produces uh, the, the, the entanglement the, the way in which space-time points are connected. So this is something quite a radical. It says that for Einstein's dream was essentially that everything was built out, out of the curvature of space and time. He worked very hard uh, in his quest for a grand unified theory that particles and quantum mechanics itself would be made out of space-time. I think we learn exactly the opposite space-time and general th theory of relativity is something very similar to thermodynamics. It's an emergent theory. It describes the long distance behavior of something much more bizarre and quantum mechanical at the smaller scales. So space and time are not the ultimate material out of which the universe is made. In fact, they disappear themselves. If you look at curved space-time, you know, really through uh, the lens of quantum theory and we zoom in, we see it's, uh, it's not made of, of space and time. There is some ultimate cutoff. It's very much like zooming in into a pixel on your computer screen, on, on the picture on your computer screen, and you can see the individual pixels. And that underlying Einstein's dream, there is this kind of a dream of quantum information being kind of the bedrock of our understanding of reality. Uh, but isn't it uh, wonderful that even to understand that picture, we need this very important concept of quantum entanglement. And so it just shows that you know, Albert Einstein was not only very, very clever, but the ideas that he discovered were even cleverer than he was.
and they are right at the forefront of our understanding. So thank you very much for listening to this lecture. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Diagra, for that incredible journey. Thank you. Uh, can we uh, can uh, can we have uh, unmute all and can we have a, a, a round of applause for Professor Diagra's beautiful lecture, please? Thank you. Uh, so, uh, okay, so there are a whole bunch of queries. Uh, with your permission, I would like to put up to you a proper subset of the same and yes, request please. your response. <laughs> Perfect. So let's start. Okay, so there are a few queries uh, which essentially are asking about uh, um, what could the dark energy possibly be? For example, would it satisfy, would it follow the Bose-Einstein statistics uh, and so forth? So yeah, that's of course- well, the, the brief answer is of course, we don't know. And there are essentially two possible solutions. One is that it's indeed the cosmological constant. So it's, it's a quantum uh, uh, energy field. It would not be made out of, 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 of uh, particles, it would be made out of these quantum fluctuations, so it's, it's, it's truly uh, empty space, it's the quantum vacuum. Um, so uh, I would say that's still, you know, a very good bet. Uh, another option is that it, uh, it's an actual physical field, it's, it's something like the Higgs field, it's something that, you know, uh, is, it's, is pervasive in, in empty space. And it could have, you know, certain properties that it would, you know, change under the cosmological evolution. Uh, so only careful measurement will know. The thing, you know, the, the biggest issue with this quantum vacuum interpretation is that any calculation of the size of that effect, now if you just do an order of magnitude, you would say, well, you know, the size of that energy should be of the order of the Planck energy. And that would mean that the physical universe would be the size of a tennis ball. It's not, it's much larger. So it's incredible. So the fact that I showed you this picture of the of these various orders of magnitude in the universe, and we see that going from the Planck scale to the size of the universe is a, basically a factor of 10 to the 60. And the square of that 10 to 120 is essentially the value of this cosmological constant. So the value of the cosmological constant basically sets the size of the physical universe. And it's an absolute mystery why the universe is so large, you know, why there is a smallest and a largest scale, and why they differ by 60 order of magnitudes. Could have been zero or 10 or a million. We don't know. Uh, and that's you know, why I like to call dark energy still a sea monster, because you know, it's a nice name that is basically hiding our ignorance. OK, there are a few more queries. Uh... Uh, pertaining to dark matter and dark energy. For example, there's one which says, are the two interchangeable? Is dark matter and dark energy interchangeable? No, it's not. So um, no, dark matter is just matter that we don't understand. So if you look at the Einstein equations, you saw on the left-hand side, there was uh, the curvature of space-time. On the right-hand side, there were two terms. There was the space, the energy distribution of particles and forces and radiation plus this kind of vacuum energy or, or uh, dark energy. So dark matter contributes to the first term. So we know it's something that is you now uh, clusters together gravitationally. It's lumped together, it's lumpy. Uh, the dark energy by definition is uniform. It's only one value, it's a cross space. It's just a property of empty space. Um, dark uh, matter is clustering together, but we have no idea is it made out of a single particle? Is it made out of a whole world? Um, now, if there's no communication between dark matter on the one hand and our visible matter on the other hand, now perhaps we are dark matter from the perspective of people made out of the dark and the dark matter. So uh, again, you know, it's uh, it's perhaps uh, you know a, a, a breathtakingly. Uh, terrific over a simplification to, to assume that something that feels uh, you know, that's five times more important for the structure of the universe is made out of a single particle, while we 
our visible uh, matter is made out of these 17 different particles of the standard model. So you know, there could be a huge intricate uh, web of physics residing in dark matter. We don't know, but it's definitely distinct from dark energy. Okay, uh, so there's a query which says, theoretically, does the true vacuum, and I'm assuming the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the person who, uh, who has put up this query is assuming a single vacuum, so is the true, does the true vacuum theoretically even contain dark matter or can it contain dark matter? Well, I think you're probably asking whether, you know, uh, the vacuum, uh, let me put it like this, the vacuum, quantum theory, everything that is allowed happens. So these quantum fluctuations are quantum fluctuations of all forms of physics. So if you think, for instance, of Hawking radiation, it would radiate, you no, know, electromagnetism, gravity, quarks, electrons, but also dark matter particles, because everything in the quantum theory would. So dark matter could give a contribution, that is to say, to the uh, to the energy content uh, of of the of the vacuum. Uh, perhaps that's one way in which uh, the two are connected. And the last two uh, pertaining to uh, dark matter uh, has are have an experimental flavor. So one of them says, is it possible that uh, dark matter could be discovered in experiments similar to the neutrinos? And the second asks, does the recent G minus two discrepancy uh, be attributable to dark matter? Well, for one thing is, you know, dark matter, if it exists, and we, we, we very much believe so, uh, if it's made out of particles, then there are two ways to de de detect these particles. I would say three in some sense. So essentially, we could be very lucky, and one of these particles could come from the universe, and we could, uh, you know, uh, in one of our astrophysical experiments, we could detect them, like we do in these under underground mines. The second uh, way in which we could do it is, you know, produce it directly in one of the particle uh, accelerators. But the wonderful thing of particle physics is that you know certain particles can foreshadow their appearance. That is to say, they can appear in quantum loops, in quantum effects. So uh, apart from outright explicitly producing the particles, as we did with the Higgs particle, we can detect these particles indirectly because they will be uh, happening in quantum processes. And so if this uh, muon experiment uh, stands, it looks like there is some physics of beyond the standard model that actually is causing these effects, causing, so you, instead of, you know, you basically by doing very accurate measurements, you can see the, the, the quantum effects that are you know, very many, many orders of magnitude uh, smaller than the leading effect. And that actually is some way to, to probe this. So you're quite right that, you know, by doing these careful measurements of the standard model and seeing deviations, we can detect indirectly the presence of other particles and um, you know, uh, who knows, uh, some of these particles can emerge. Now, uh, there are many good candidates uh, for dark matter particles, um, like axions, that uh, you know, could be quite close also to direct the uh, detection. So uh, that's why everybody is very excited. Of course, we're all disappointed if we do not find them. But with uh, particle physics, now you have to be very patient. Uh, no news is bad news. But good news is tremendous, it's a revolution. We only need to find one little indication to completely change our perspective. And so that's why the discovery of the Higgs particle was also front page news, because you know it totally changed our way of thinking about physics. Um, so yeah, no, it's very exciting to see that uh, these, uh, these detailed measurements of collisions happening in Fermilab, but also uh, in another, uh, the underground experiments, and also, of course, at CERN, when the LHC starts up again, could uh, give some indirect uh, you know, evidence for dark matter. OK. Um, uh, so there is a, a query which says, it asks, is there any change in the rigidity of space-time due to the expansion of the universe? Um, well, I say space is not rigid, because it can be curved. Um, uh, but the, the, the expanding universe is in some sense a quite a simple model. And I saw some, some question, now how should we think about it? So the universe is expanding and expanding faster and faster. Um, 
Now it's now 14 billion years old. Uh, you know, now you don't have to wait that long, say a few hundred billion years, for the universe to, uh, you know, so right now, roughly two thirds of the energy is in terms of uh, dark energy. And it will of course increase and increase because the matter will be more and more diluted. So quite soon we'll be at a stage where the predominant effect will be dark energy and the universe will start to expand exponentially. And in an exponential expansion, a cosmic horizon will be formed, very similar to a black hole horizon. However, now we're not outside the horizon, we're inside the horizon. And it will also tell us that, you know, at some point, um, the depth, so how far can we look inside, uh, you know, far, far away, that the depth in which we can look uh, into the universe will be limited. So at some point, you know, there will be a finite distance uh, which is not that much uh, 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 larger than the Hubble scale, which will be the, the most that we can see. So even if we wait till eternity, the part of the universe that will be visible to us will be the part that's inside this cosmic horizon. And so that will be only a finite fraction or finite part of the universe. And so there, uh, that's exactly, you know, in some sense, that will be the long-term prediction of the expanding expansion of the universe. As I said, you know, the universe is flexible because it can be curved, but on a quantum scale, it's even much more flexible because itself, you know, even you, as I try to explain, it, try to uh, explain, it uh, looks more like a sponge than a rigid material. Okay. Uh, the next is uh, Aquarius asks: Do gravitational waves disrupt dark matter in the same way that normal matter gets stretched by a very small amount? Yes. So a gravitational wave actually distorts space-time itself. So think of space-time as the surface of the sea, uh, of water, and think of the uh, dark matter or ordinary matter or anything else as just objects floating in the water. If the wave comes uh, through, then they start bobbing and they start moving around. So yes, everything is being disturbed, including empty space and time itself. Okay, um, so there's a question. Uh, the, um, the, uh, let's see. The fact that only one electron can travel up and down in time, there was this uh, image uh, that you've shown, and create many images of itself. Does that mean that the total number of particles may change? Okay, so let me explain what happened. So when uh, Wheeler suggested this idea to Feynman, Feynman apparently immediately said, this can't be true because then there are equal number of particles and antiparticles. And we know there are many more electrons than anti-electrons. So it's not true there's only one electron in the universe, but there's something else is true. If you look at a single electron, say electron that's orbiting one of the atoms in your body, that electron is not just going straight up, it's making these zigzag movements. And that means that if you look at a single electron through a microscope, you will start to see the zigzag pattern and you will see that the electron is surrounded by a cloud of particles and antiparticles. So a single electron will have a cloud, say of N uh, electrons, virtual electrons, and N minus one anti-electrons or positrons. That is to say, if you, an ordinary electron is shielded by this cloud of virtual particles. And so one way we measure this is that we, if we look at the electric charge of an electron, for instance, at a particle accelerator like the LHC, we probing more of that cloud. So we see more the naked electron and the electric charge of a, 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 an electron that's being produced in a particle accelerator is actually larger than the electric charge that's being measured in, uh, I would say at room temperature or at long distance. So uh, the effect actually does exist. And a better way to understand that, that the, the, the classical concept of a particle as a little billiard ball that's moving up in space time should be replaced by this uh, zigzag pattern. And therefore it's not a billiard ball, it's a particle surrounded by this diffuse cloud of virtual particles that you see 
uh, more predominantly if you actually zoom in to the particle, which you do using particle accelerators. Okay, uh, there's a question. Is there a relationship between relativistic jets and Hawking radiation? <laughs> no. So uh, there are two ways in which a matter or a light can escape, quote unquote, from the black hole. The first, which is the traditional one, is that particles, a matter is you know, being pulled into the black hole. It, it, it rotates around it. Uh, it. Since it's charged matter, it will produce a lot of radiation. And so uh, that radiation escapes but it's escaping from matter that is outside the horizon. That's why we see uh, these big beams coming out of uh, black holes. So it's quite spectacular. If you look at galaxies that have these active supermassive black holes, so that means black holes that are actually swallowing up a lot of these matter from nearby stars, they radiate out, uh, basically, uh, they radiate out radio radiation that actually is of the size of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of light years. So the, the, the beams that come out of it are of the same size of even larger than the size of the galaxy. But this is all met, uh, light or electromagnetic radiation escaping before the matter falls into it. Uh, it's very violent and that's why we're able to see. It's also very intense because that's why we're able to see, for instance, this near horizon area of the M87 black hole once again, you know, this is the largest magnification that they ever did. The, the Event Horizon Telescope sees things a thousand times more magnified than, than, than the Hubble or any other uh, telescope that we have, but can only see things that are incredibly intense. And so that's why these, these, this near horizon area of black holes are one of the most intense sources of radio radiation in the world. But that's actually escaping before you fall in. Uh, and Hawking radiation is escaping after you're falling in. So it's the matter that was swallowed by the black hole escaping, and it goes in pro inverse proportional to the mass. So if you have a huge uh, supermassive black hole inside the galaxy, the Hawking effect is very, very, very tiny. Uh, in fact, the Hawking effect will be predominant if you have a very small black hole. So one thing that people are looking at, if black holes, say, radiate, or perhaps, you know, small, you know, planet size, or even, you know, the size of, a, of, of, of an atom have been made in the universe, the last few milliseconds of their life, just before they completely evaporate, their mass will be very tiny, but the radiation will be very intense. So a black hole, uh, most intense part of the Hawking radiation is at the very end of its life, when it's very, 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 very tiny. So in some sense, these two effects are complementary. And of course, we have never ever ob observed uh, direct physical uh, re Hawking radiation. Right, in fact, I'd like to remind our, uh, our uh, viewers, uh, I guess those of us who had tuned in for uh, Professor Ramesh Narayan's lecture. Uh, so he's uh, the guy who was part of the Event Horizon team and uh, the iconic image uh, which Professor Digraph showed us uh, that's exactly the one uh, that he was, in fact, a part in actually getting that image. So it's 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 obviously, I mean, it's it's one of those images, as Professor Diagraf said, uh, which has been, uh, which I mean, all of us have seen at some point or the other. Okay. And so, I must say, you know, one of the most remarkable thing is that uh, you know we live. Uh, so I would like to say, you know, there is only once that you can see the first image of a black hole, and uh, there's only once when you can detect the first gravitational waves. And all of us were around. So, you know, in thousands of years, you know, people say, well, you know, there are two kinds of radiation, electromagnetic. I think we don't know when the first uh, person or the object that was alive on the planet had detected it must have been some bacteria billions of years ago. And there's only once you can see a black hole. And isn't that remarkable? Now, just in the last um, yeah, five years that we uh, all together uh, witnessed these dramatic breakthroughs. And, you know, in thousands of years, people will still uh, print these iconic images. And you know, we were around. So that just shows all of us, particularly the students, that you are living perhaps in one of the most exciting areas 
eras of uh, of science in general. And you know, it, it's rapidly progressing, and we have these breakthrough events. And isn't it remarkable that for both of these cases, it were worldwide experiments. We used an uh, an, an observation method that used the whole planet. That there were teams from around the world, uh, including uh, India, including the Netherlands, uh, in both of them. And um, and you know, they were uh, essentially showing that Albert Einstein, what he was thinking, just you know himself. Uh, in front of a blackboard a uh, hundred years before. So I think, you know, just to let that sink in, and I hope that motivates you to, uh, you know, seek your life in, in physics. Beautiful. Uh, all right, so there are a few more. Um, uh, so there is a, a query which says, if the since the entropy is something which increases with time, what can we tell about the entropy of particles inside a black hole? Mm. Well, you know, there are a lot of questions about what happens with particles outside and inside. And in fact, this is an area of active investigation because you can wonder, you know, if physics is describing the world, um, you know, it's what do we mean by describing the world? That means that we cannot describe the part of the universe that's invisible, that's behind the cosmic horizon. And we cannot describe the world which is inside the black hole, which is inside the event horizon. So does it even make sense to talk about the physics inside the black holes? And you know, there's, there's a deep line of thinking which is called complementarity that you know, perhaps understanding the physics inside the black hole, that the inside of the black hole and the outside of black hole should be related. Perhaps there is some kind of non-local way in which the two are connected. And perhaps you know, by carefully measuring the outside of the black hole, we can at least capture part of the inside of the black hole. So it goes much too far, but the current line of research in quantum black holes is very much about these questions. So any naive question about what's happening inside and outside turns to be out really, really complicated because in some way, part of the inside of a black hole is encoded in the outside and already said that you know, we probably think of the universe a little bit like a hologram. So all our four-dimensional space-time is a little bit like a, a three-dimensional hologram. And it doesn't really make sense to talk about space, to talk about time. These are all derived concepts. You should, uh, you should speak about quantum information. And if you probe deeper, then it turns out this distinction between the inside and the outside is much more subtle than you think. So. Um, Actually, the, the right way to think about this is using this image of quantum information. And then all of these questions are much more subtle, uh, but some of them have beautiful answers. So um, I want to leave it at that. All right. Uh, there are a couple of uh, queries, again, related to uh, black holes, which one is, in fact, three of them. Uh, one is that uh, it's, uh, it's the virtual particles or off-shell particles. If Hawking radiation exists, there must be so many off-shell particles in the universe. So how is their dynamics interpreted in our usual QFT of physics? That's a very good question. So uh, in, in all these images of quantum particles and you know, going up and down, et cetera, we should realize these are virtual particles. Now, virtual particles are different from physical particles in the sense they cannot be measured. They can only, their effects are indirect. In some sense, you could even argue they do not exist. They are a nice bookkeeping device for our quantum computations. So even if you think of the usual Feynman diagrams, where like an electron is repelling another electron because it exchanges a photon, the photon that it exchanges is not visible. If you put two magnets close to each other, apparently there are photons flying over, but these are virtual photons. You never see sparks flying uh, between two magnets. The thing is that uh, sometimes a particle can become a physical particle, and then it can be detected. And that's when it's like on the mass shells, as we say, it, survive, it has the right properties of mass and energy and momentum. So with Hawking radiation, the following thing can happen. You can have a pair of particles where the outgoing particle, the particle that I thought is escaping, is actually on shell, it's physical. So there are many virtual particles, and you can think of them as flying through the universe, but they're not measurable. But the physical particle is measurable. 
But the point is, if the outgoing particle is a physical particle, so that means it satisfies its mass energy relation, then the particle that's inside the black hole, almost by definition, is unphysical. But that's fine. It can still have this effect of lowering the energy mass. Now, of course, all of this is a caricature, because in the end, you have to do a very different computation. But it's, it's important to realize that you know, virtual particles are a wonderful way to visualize what's happening in quantum mechanics. But it's essentially something that we human beings, human physicists, have thought of, of understanding the law of quantum theory. So, um, but if I, mean, I join, I, mean, I, 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 I welcome you to think about uh, the quantum empty space as being filled with these virtual particles, because actually I think it, it does show how different empty space time is uh, through the lens of quantum theory compared to uh, what the classical image is. And often I joke you know, that the most exciting thing to study in physics is empty space time, is nothing. Now, I don't think we would get a billion dollar research grants if we propose uh, to the world to study nothing. But in fact, we are studying nothing. It's the most important thing in the universe. It's the most important thing in studying the fundamental laws of physics. And, um, and so in that sense, uh, uh, I, I invite you to, to use these images of virtual particles freely. Okay, so there was a query. Uh, okay, there's a question which says, why do forces change with scale? Yes, uh, that's a terrific question. And I think I already uh, uh, explained this a little bit. So there are two ways, of course, that they explain and scale, uh, scale. One that's like the one over R squared law of gravity. I'm sure that's not what you meant. The fact is that uh, the strength of the force, like the uh, Newton's constant or the, or the electromagnetic uh, charge of a particle changes because of these quantum effects. So the way to think about that is, as I said before, Particles are surrounded by clouds of virtual particle. Empty space gets essentially polarized. And so it's like a medium, electromagnetic medium, that's being polarized and that shields, in the case of electromagnetism, the electric charge. That's why electron at close distance has a higher electric charge than far away. For quarks and the, the strong nuclear force, exactly the opposite happens. They also have a cloud but that cloud works the other way around because of the non-abelian nature. So if you take a little quark, it's surrounded by a cloud of uh, quarks, anti-quarks, but also gluons. And they all are, it's a big mass, a big cloud of interacting, strongly interacting nuclear matter. And in fact, it does the op opposite, it anti-shields. So uh, the forces between quarks are larger if you look at them at large distance. And if you zoom in, they become smaller and smaller. And in fact, this is the way we understand quark confinement. If you look at quarks very close up, they exactly feel no force at all. So it's the interplay between quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and these, these virtual particles that changes uh, the, the characteristics of nature on each energy scale. And this is a very deep idea um, it means that if we zoom in nature, not only do we see different things, but in fact, the fundamental laws change. And I think this is a very deep concept. And uh, it also explains in some sense why if we think about space-time at the smallest distances, we shouldn't think of Newtonian or Einsteinian gravity, because truly the interaction of gravity change in a dramatic way if you close, uh, close up. And we said, you know, it's so dramatic that they're not only virtual particles, but there's even like virtual space-time points. Space-time itself dissolves. OK, uh, so another question, which is, if we consider that the universe had a singularity before Big Bang, or was, I think, uh, sorry, the universe was a singularity before Big Bang, and now we are saying that there was inflation before the Big Bang. So how can a point expand? <laughs> so this is a question often asked. So how can a point uh, expand? So it's wrong to think of um, the, uh, the universe as being compressed to a point. So first of all, the universe is much larger than the physical universe we can see. 
So if we think of the universe as an infinite plane, we can think of the physical universe as a like a, a circle on that plane. And that's, you know, we are inside that circle. Now, if you go back in time, the scale of that infinite plane shrinks. So the circle becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. But the plane is still infinite, right? So it's, uh, it's uh, even a fraction before the Big Bang. It's still an infinite plane, but anything on the plane is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's a little bit like you're kind of uh, take a, a picture and you zoom out, you know, things get smaller or zoom out. Yeah. So things could become smaller and smaller. Now it's clearly something dramatic happens when you go to epsilon before t equals zero to t equals zero, because then the whole concept of the plane disappears. So it's our physical universe was very small, but the whole universe was probably just of the same size because it was infinite. Now, clearly, there's something dramatic happening at the Big Bang. And that's very similar to the question what happens at t equals zero inside the black hole. That's where the singularity resides. And I, as I try to say, you know, it's, you know, in some sense, it's like, again, like zooming in in, 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 a, in a computer screen. Uh, at some point, you start to see the individual pixels, probably in a, in a much more complicated way than, you know, than a discretization. So I would say if you get to a Planck size or a Planck's time length, which is 10 to the minus 43 seconds, before the actual Big Bang, the whole concept of space and time disappears. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit, if you think of a, a photo on your computer, it's, you know, it's a lot of zeros and ones. And if you scale it and scale it, you know, something happens to the zero and ones. But you know, in the end, it doesn't make sense anymore to talk about a photo. It's just a little bit of information. Another uh, metaphor I sometimes use, if you think of the beginning of a river, right? So you can go upstream and you find a little brook. And at some point, you find a few drops of water you know, on the meadow of a, of a mountain. Uh, the whole concept of a river has disappeared before you can ask the question, where exactly did the river start? Oh, very interesting. Um, so there's a query about gauge gravity duality. It, it asks, how do gravitons, how do gravitons modes, how are they found in gauge gravity duality? What is a gauge field, I guess, on the gravity side? And that unusual gauge theory does gravity induction occur in the theory? I'm not sure what that means, but yeah. well, okay. So, so basically, what we are building is a dictionary between two kinds of theories: theories with gravity and theories without gravity. And um, and what we see is in order to describe and that there is equivalence between them. This is like a dictionary, and it turns out that in order to describe gravity, particularly like in the Einsteinian sense. We have to study the other theory without gravity with gauge fields at a very strong quantum process. So in some sense, it's really understanding the quantum, the deep, strongly interacting quantum behavior of gauge theories that leads to the classical behavior of gravity according to Einstein's equations. And then you can ask in the dictionary, so you can look up graviton or gravitational wave in the uh, on the Einstein side and see what is it on the on the gate theory side, and basically what we see is that you know on the in the gate theory you have uh, energy, and you have uh, you know uh, you can couple uh, technically to the stress tensor of that gate theory field, and you can have like a you know a look at modes that couple to the stress tensor, and essentially kind of uh, these modes that in the end uh, corresponds to uh, studying the, the gravitational waves or gravitational physics on the other, on the other hand. Uh, so, but essentially what it tells you is that you know, gravity, there's not a one, it's not a one-to-one, -one, it you really have to understand in a deep way, the strong coupling phenomena on the gate theory to get essentially Einstein's equations out on the other side. So typically with these dictionaries, Easy questions on one side become difficult questions on the other, and vice versa. Then you can ask the question, well, if we think of theories of quantum gravity indirectly in terms of these gate theories, 
is every gate theory or in fact is even every quantum system can it be viewed as describing an alternative gravitational world and i think right now we say yes but you know if you take the hydrogen atom and i ask you know what kind of gravitational system is the hydrogen atom describing it's a very bizarre quantum gravitational system you know it doesn't have large space it doesn't have black holes it has none of the typical characteristics of gravity so I would say that there is a, perhaps every system, even like our standard model, has an interpretation in terms of gravitational physics, probably will not be very helpful. And there's a subclass of gate systems, of quantum mechanical systems, that correspond to, I would say, canonical gravitational systems, where you have large space times, where you can have black holes, where you can have a universe, where you can get, you know, can can get the semi-classical approximation to Einstein equation. But often these systems are more exotic on the quantum effect. So uh, the, the short answer is that perhaps at some point we have to think very broadly and creatively about what quantum gravity is and that every quantum system then seems to be a uh, gravitational system. But the systems that do particularly well are quantum systems with many, many degrees of freedom. In fact, ideally, they have a measurement of the number of degrees of freedom. And by sending that number to infinity, actually, you make the gravitational side behave semi-classically. So there is, in all these systems, there is a dial, which is usually n, the number of colors. So it's a UN gate theory, typically. You, you turn that number of colors to a very high value, and then you tune the system such that on the gravitational side, it starts to behave according to Einstein's equations. Great. Uh, there's a question which says, asks, uh, can or should the singularities be described with a different set of laws? Uh, other, I mean, different, let's say different from the ones that we are used to. I think the answer is yes. Because, you know, there's a long, uh, by the way, there's a long um, history of uh, worrying, you know, whenever you have a law in, 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 in physics, think of Newton's law. It's terrific. But then the question is, how do the solutions to that equation behave? And like in the 19th century, people were very uh, anxious about uh, describing the solar system according to Newton's laws. And worrying that actually it's a singular solution. That is to say that at some finite time, the speed and the uh, position of one of the planets become infinite. So it would mean planet Earth would be ejected to, you know, would have an infinite speed and the whole system would break down. So we know even if you're simple differential equation, you can, you can have a singularity. So it's very important that our, the solutions to our equations are non-singular. Now we know that if such a singularity happens, as for instance, you know, in the atom, where we worried about the electromagnetic singularity, uh, electrons spiraling inwards, losing energy by electromagnetic radiation and you know, falling into the, the nucleus, uh, that would again be a singularity. It would be the end of electromagnetism. Of course, there quantum mechanics came to the rescue. It says, well, no, orbits are quantized and that's why an electron cannot fall into the nucleus. I think in the same way, the biggest singularity problem we are confronted right now is that Einstein's equations are absolutely beautiful, but they have singular solutions. And as uh, Wheeler said, how can the laws of physics lead to no physics? If there's a singularity, our understanding ends, and basically it's a breakdown of science. So I think there's only one solution, is that the equations get modified. That happened for the atom. We went from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. It now happens with relativity, with gravity. And that's why we feel we have to move from quant gravity to quantum gravity. Uh, perhaps string theory is a first good step in that direction. But definitely, I think Einstein's equations has to be modified, not in a way as that uh, adding the cosmological constant in a much deeper way. And you know, one um, good metaphor we always feel is that the Einstein's equations are very similar to the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, in fact, there's a very nice correspondence between the, the, the behavior of black holes and the laws of thermodynamics. Now, thermodynamics has also certain issues. And we know that if you zoom in in a gas of particles, 
at some point, the laws of thermodynamics are not true anymore because they are statistical laws. So you have to resort to describing the movement of individual atoms. If you have a gas made out of two atoms, there's no longer satisfies the law of thermodynamics. It's two, two, two billiard balls bouncing around. So I think in the same way, we think of Einstein's theory as a emergent or statistical law describing the behavior or whatever the atoms of space time are in the scale when you have many, many of them, in fact, strictly speaking, infinite. And uh, so that law will probably be modified in the same way as many laws of, of a statistical nature are modified once we understand the microscopic constituents. Okay, the next is a pair of queries by the, uh, uh, by the same person uh, having to do with entanglement. So the, it goes, okay. the first part goes as follows. If entanglement can be consider, considered as a wormhole connection, does that mean that after the measurement is done, uh, the wormhole connection is disconnected? The wormholes are disconnected, that's the first part. And the second is, uh, does that mean that we can use entanglement as a way to create wormholes? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, there are many interesting questions here. So again, you know, think about this as a dictionary. There's a dictionary with two languages. One is the language of quantum mechanics on one side, and then there's the language of gravity on the other side. And there's a dictionary you can connect one to the other. So basically the insight here is that in the dictionary, if you look up entanglement on the quantum side, you get wormhole on the other side. And so there is, you, you, they're not happening at the same time. One is describing, is a way, a language to describing the other. Now you're really pointing out some very deep questions. And I think briefly we're all still struggling with it because like quantum mechanics, you know, has lots of issues with the measurement problem. So what happens if you go to another quantum state? What would it actually mean on the, at the, on the side of the, of the, of the gravitational picture? And you know that, you know, if you think of the standard formulation of quantum mechanics as a vector moving in Hilbert space, there are no transitions or whatever, you know, it's, it's smooth, it's a smooth uh, dynamics. Uh, of course, you have superpositions, etc. So uh, it goes too far to answer that question directly. I would say, you know, you're, that's right at where we are at the cutting edge of modern theoretical physics. We're exactly probing questions like that. And you know it's it's complicated. I would say there there are other, um, but you know one thing we have seen is that um, you know uh, if that dictionary is true, um, you know, it's very exciting in the sense that you can almost build a gravitational or quantum gravitational system in the lab by uh, putting quantum information in a certain context. So that's why people who study quantum computers are excited about this because. Perhaps you can almost program a quantum computer and make a simulation of a quantum gravitational system. Of course, you wouldn't see the space time. You wouldn't see the wormholes. You're just, you're just typing in and you're controlling this quantum experiment. But the physics that describes the evolution of quantum information would be in some sense interpretable along the laws of gravity and, and vice versa. So that, that's extre extremely exciting. I think these questions are very deep questions. Honestly, I think, you know, we should be fair. There are deep issues with relativity theory and, and gravity, like black holes, like the Big Bang, but also, of course, deep issues of confusion about quantum mechanics. Because, you know, none of us feel really comfortable with quantum mechanics. Now, what exactly is happening out there? What do we, how do we think about the measurement problem? You know, quantum mechanics, deals with time as a, in a very unimaginative way. It's just a continuous parameter that's controlling the Schrodinger equation. So you know, both, I would say, are flawed or feel incomplete. And Einstein's first intu intuition when he did the EPR work is that quantum mechanics is incomplete. You know? And I think he's right. You no, know, it's certainly incomplete in the sense that we feel not comfortable with the level of understanding we have. So secretly, by trying to match the two things, I've talked about how quantum mechanics can change our view on gravity. Secretly, I think all of us hope that gravity can similarly change our view on quantum mechanics. And perhaps in the end, now we know Einstein's theory is incomplete. Einstein's laws have to be changed. 
and quantum mechanics can help us think about in which way. But in the end, uh, we all, I think, secretly hope that gravity and Einstein's relativity will also tell us how to change, modify, or improve the law of quantum mechanics. And that will be extremely exciting. Uh, but anyhow, the fact that there is this discussion now, this dialogue, that there is a new way to address these issues is, uh, is I think, you know, intellectually uh, an, a, a breakthrough of the highest level. I think that insight, that the theory of gravity and quantum mechanics are complementary in the same way as you can think of an electron as a particle or a wave. And there's this concept, you know, of duality. And there are two different perspectives on only one kind of physics because there's only one kind of universe. I think that's, you know, uh, is a breakthrough of the highest order, I think, in, in theoretical physics. And uh, possibly another query in the same equivalence class of queries, if there is one, uh, which is, does the theory of wormholes resolve the paradox of time ending at the singularity of a black hole? No, it does not. Um, uh, it's, uh, you know, because it's, uh, the wormhole is a way in which essentially the two interiors of the horizon are, are connected. Uh, but if you look at the, the space-time diagram, there was still a singularity. So it, it doesn't dissolve the singularity. Okay, uh, so that brings us to the last query, uh, which is, and I'll just read it. It's a pretty heavy sounding one uh, from my <laughs> humble viewpoint, which is could the rather hypothetical primordial black holes account for dark matter? What are the chances of these primordial black holes having interacted with the incipient earth about 4.5 billion years ago? Yeah, that's a very good question. So we talked about black holes being formed by uh, collapsing stars. But there is, uh, for a long time, people have speculated that you know, when the universe was born, and there's this very violent phase where there was a lot of matter clumped together. Uh, as you said, you know, if, if we really believe inflation, our whole physical universe would be the size, you know, I could actually hold it in my hands. So why weren't there violent clumps of matter? And why weren't there miniature black holes formed? Uh, and what size are these black holes? In fact, we don't even know that the supermassive black holes in the center of uh, our galaxies uh, were formed uh, by collective collisions with smaller stars. So there is a probability that there are um, primordial black holes that were in the universe from the very, very, very beginning of, you know, from the very, very early universe. And then the question is, you know, is, uh, is it possible that uh, these, these clouds of dark matter are actually primordial black holes? Um, you know, there are a lot of issues around this. You know, are these things then colliding? Can we come somehow find their measurements? Uh, I'm actually not an expert on this, um, but um, if you start to think about you know, a relatively small black hole that's just floating through space, uh, how easy is it for us to detect? Uh, no, if it, it will, will not draw in matter. It might not collide with another black hole. If it even does, it will have gravitational waves that are much too weak to detect. So um, there could be a lot of stuff going on there. And again, you know that um, that uh, just shows us that when I was painting this uh, picture of the universe as this map, the little part mapped out, and this large part, essentially, it's you know these are blank spots, and we put a lot of uh, sea monster there. But you know this this is certainly a an, an op a, prob a possibility. Uh, I think when the gravitational wave detector was switched on, the fact that we detected black holes, which are roughly, you know, typically 20, 50 times the, the mass of the sun, these were much larger black holes than we thought were there. Perhaps there are tiny black holes, perhaps they're all around us, perhaps they're just flying through the earth without us noticing. Uh, you know, uh, people might worry about that, but I think actually that's quite exciting. And the, the, the marvelous thing is that we are getting to now a stage where our experiments becoming so sophisticated that we can more and more detect these. So yes, this is a possible scenario. I'm not sure what the probabilities are, but uh, stay tuned. Perfect. I think uh, uh, there is a beautiful comment which actually summarizes, I believe, the collective sentiment of everybody attending this lecture. And I think we're going to end uh, your lecture with that. I'll just read it out verbatim. And the comment is, I'm leaving engineering for physics. And the reason is this man. And there are five explanatory, uh, exclamation marks there. So thank you. <laughs> I, I couldn't I just say, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. <laughs>
And let me just say thank you so much for for this. And I just want to say to everybody, I know you're in a very difficult situation now. And and, and my heart goes out to you and to your family members and your friends. And and, and collectively, the whole world is going through this. But uh, I just want to say how wonderful it is that collectively, as a whole world, we also unified in you know trying to understand the world and uh who knows some of you i might see here in princeton i'd love to come uh, visit you once but uh the fact that we are doing this together and it's so exciting i hope that gives you a little bit uh, of of hope and, and 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 a positive outlook to the future because uh there are very few things that actually give positive news but i would say science and physics is one of them thank you in fact i just wanted to uh give you a heads up. I don't know which way it's going to turn out, but uh, our institute is going to be hosting the what we call as the uh, the biennial Indian Strings meeting, which is an international strings meeting this December. And if, if uh, you know, international travel is a go ahead, we would be so happy to have you here. It'll be such a delight. And uh, I wish it works well, out. Well, it would be a pleasure. Really- and if, if not then, then at another time, undoubtedly. Absolutely. And I Absolutely. just want to wish you well in everything. And, and think of the opening slide of, uh, of Einstein seeking, uh, you know, eternal truth in a world in chaos. And I think that's a good, <laughs> that's a good way to summarize our lives, I think. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Diagraph. Uh, I, we really appreciate uh, all the, your incredible patience. Uh, I was thinking it's going to be like another second part of your talk, just in terms of the queries. It was an unending stream. In fact, there's still more, but I mean, I think uh, we will uh, call it, uh, uh, I mean, we'll end it here. So thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye to everyone. Bye bye. Stay safe. All right, folks, with that, we come to the conclusion of uh, uh, the, uh, the 14th lecture in the series. Uh, thanks once again. Uh, please stay safe. And, team, I'm ending the meeting now. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>